You're listening to The Valley Current. You know, I went to Berkeley in the 1960s. Mm -hmm. And then I went to Boston University Law School. Right. And uh, in in the early 70s, because I dropped out for a few years while I did computers. Right. That was a special era. And I I have certain attitudes that I acquired then. Mm -hmm. It's very hard for me to outgrow them or to get beyond them. Right. But this kind of law brings it all to the surface, doesn't it? It, it does, and I think it's it's going to remain contentious for probably the next decade or more, absent yep. some sort of unifying theme that plays out as a result of the world becoming far more intelligent with artificial intelligence. Like if you imagine an optimistic future, there is there are people imagining a much more optimistic future where there's so much more intelligence available with the computing that we have that people start to actually themselves become more intelligent and that has a cultural impact like you have to imagine that you're raising up the level of human intelligence on a collective basis in a way that itself creates greater cooperation like right now you know to use the ukraine and the Putin wacky situation that's happening there with Russia versus Ukraine. That just seems like caveman error stuff to me. I mean, that it just does. seems like we're back to World War One. It and does. Mustard gas. They're talking about, well, maybe, maybe gas is next. And that's always been sort of a red line given what happened in World War Two and even given what happened in World War One. And right. there are optimists that believe that we are evolving towards a higher intelligence that's being generated by all the computational intelligence. Now, whether you believe that or not is another question. There are those who believe that as the computers get smarter, we get dumber. Exactly. We all float. We we all float in thinking. Right. Remember when you used to be able to just use, do the math in your head or use a piece of paper. Now people have to find a calculator before they can multiply that's right and say that's equal to 12 right that's right that's right that's right no it's it's uh the other thing that i noticed about this law i mean if you read the law in detail which is not that easy because it's Mm -hmm. 20 pages long right it's got a lot of little mistakes in it for example if this if the penalties which include injunction will make it difficult burden the woman in her effort to get an abortion then the doctor can go ahead with it what the hell is that Opposite right. to the whole intention. Right. Well, they, uh, they're trying to put in some safety valve. Correct. To, to assure some degree of constitutionality. That's sort of a sort of a passing, a passing way to say, well, we're trying to get this. Correct. To be, to be considered uh, constitutional. Right. That's really what's going on. That's it. And no definition of medical emergency which in uh, Planned Parenthood versus Casey is discussed uh, because there was a Philadelphia statute there. And they talked about what is an, a medical emergency. It's very, very, the, the whole law of abortion is, it's more than law. It's different from law. And whatever the Supreme Court says about it's not our job to get involved in the morals, it's not true. The Supreme Court is a moral agency, and that is a virtue of American society. And a problem. You know, were you shocked to read about Justice Thomas's wife? And yeah, that, that surprised me. I, that really did surprise me. And it made me wonder, did that cause him to go into the hospital? Like, uh, in the hospital? It, it almost caused me to go in. <laughs> I, I said to myself, he must be just so uh, appalled Mortified. that any of this stuff has come out. Now, maybe he's appalled that it ever happened, too. But He's got to be pretty appalled that it's come out and he must be feeling like, you know, uh, this feels what, what did he say in that previous hearing? Uh, this is like an electronic lynching. Do you remember yeah. when he was first being, uh, yes, yes, being yes. challenged? Uh, he, you know, he, he said what's going on right now should never occur. I'm getting an electronic lynching. From yes. Him. And it made me think, you know, he must be feeling a little bit like that. At this point. He should have recused himself from the Trump suit to, to keep the documents secret. But he, he ruled in favor of Trump. Uh, the rest okay. of the court ruled against Trump. That was earlier this year. OK. And he didn't recuse himself. To me, that's unforgivable. OK. 
but but she's apparently quite a firebrand, isn't she? I, I well, she, realize that. I, I would use a different term. What would you <laughs> but, term? But I, I don't want to offend your listeners, but oh, uh, yeah, what would you use? I'm, I'm curious. Asshole. Yeah, she's. <laughs> she, I mean, you know, she's white. He's black. So it's not as though they're. You know, they're not. Uh, you can't. It's hard to categorize them. In yeah, many no. Ways, right? Don't need to categorize. I just think he should have recused himself. Mm -hmm. And uh, I hope pressure gets put on him. It would be nice to see the Supreme Court change its six-three count, if possible. Well, it looks like it's going to go when once Jackson is on. It looks like it'll go. It'll go towards. You think six it'll? Three. Oh, it'll still be six-three because six he's three. replacing Breyer. That's right. right? So yeah, so one more, wonder, one more has to wonder. Go. Yeah, you have to wonder who's next. Some people say Roberts is not in the best of health. You know, the chief judge. Oh, I didn't know that. I think well of him. I like his opinions. You know, I didn't like him when he was appointed, but the more I read his opinions, the more I like him. Right, right. So, so when you think about uh, the time frame for getting some clarity on the abortion issue generally, impossible. Never, to, never will happen. Well, versus read, this legislation, just give me your sense of where where you think it goes. Because in many ways, like you've studied the law of fiduciary duty in a lot of detail, and it seems to me that law is pretty settled from general principle point of view. You know, at the level of detail, there's nuance, but general principle, I think most lawyers would agree that you know the law has a number of general principles that are very well settled and really can't be challenged. Well, and I thought so. I thought so until I reread Roe v. Wade okay. and now read Planned Parenthood versus Casey. And I see that Roe v. Wade did not settle anything really. It did articulate something, but it didn't, re it talked about penumbral freedoms and personal rights and so on, but it didn't really articulate rules of law. And Planned Parenthood versus Casey went back and said we could change this new science, but the basic principle remains. But I have no confidence that it will remain in the Mississippi case, although the brief in Mississippi was really stupid mm -hmm. uh, and not convincing. But I think Roe v. Wade includes a five page history of abortion law, starting with ancient times. OK. And convinced me that this is a dispute which existed in the Western world from the beginning. J Junko tells me it's not in Japan. Japan has no problem with abortion. Okay. But Western Christian countries do from Christian times mm -hmm. and maybe even earlier. Uh, I'm trying to do research where Jewish law comes down on this and standing, and I'm, I'm having trouble finding the sources, so I'm going to have to do some more study. Well, but I don't think it's going to be resolved so quickly. Well, let me throw one thing in before we pass to sort of a second topic here, which is how litigation lenders might get into this oh. game. Just to spend a few minutes on that. But before we do, you know, the demographics, particularly in Japan, are headed to sort of a negative population growth. Correct. The demographics in China are headed to a negative population growth. Correct. The demographics in the United States are are slightly better, but not that much better. In other words, they're not, they're not negative, but they're they're curtailing. And if you talk, I mean, look, my daughters both have kids. They want me to be moms. There was no question. They wanted to have kids. They wanted to raise kids. But if you go and talk to a lot of college graduates, they're like, my career comes first. I really don't want to be saddled with children. They're doing stuff like freezing embryos and freezing eggs and doing I mean, yes. stuff that you know is, is is shocking. But they're spending money to maintain freedom, and a yes. lot of them are like, you know, um, I wouldn't have enough patience for kids right. and a job right now, and I don't want to manage that. So, if you look at the abortion issue in that context. The state clearly has an interest in making sure that the population doesn't go to zero, right? If you look at the really super big picture. Now, obviously, the planet's got more than enough people, and there's certainly lots of countries that have increases in population, India, for example, being one of them. Yes. And so it's not like we're going to run out of people 
to run <laughs> things if immigration no. works, right? But conceptually, there is a worry, particularly in Japan, I think, that uh, the old people are getting a lot older and there aren't as many young people to take care of them and to pay into the Social Security system. It is a so problem. Does, does that change things at all in, in looking at this abortion question? Does that sort of say the state really should make sure that 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 more more children get get raised? Now there's incentives you can give to people to have kids. If you want to give them big tax breaks, you can do that, right? I I think Roe v. Wade covered this point when they say if a woman doesn't want a child, it's abusive to have a child. Right. It ruins her life and the child's life. Right. Uh, there's also the whole issue of contraception which I believe has gotten better since 1973. Right. I believe more reliable. Yes. Uh, you know, the, is it Minnesota now that just passed a rule making it difficult to get contraceptive pills? Oh, is that right? Morning right. After, they just passed a, a, a law last week. Wow. Making post, you know, contraceptive pills, or what, it's not contraceptive. The day pills. after, the day after. The day pills. after pills. The French yeah. pill, I think it started in, in France. That pill no doubt. started in France. Like The French were ahead of us. On that, they or behind were, us, yeah, yeah. <laughs> behind us morally. Yeah. Yes, guess, right. No, it's true. Yeah, yeah. I I don't know. I I think that uh, the P Planned Parenthood versus Casey is very sensitive to the concept of eugenics not playing any role in this decision. Mm. Shouldn't play any role. Mm. But we'll see. We really will see the power of the state to pass this kind of law of a state mm -hmm. as the Supreme Court correctly said, in my opinion, we don't outlaw laws. We deal with cases. Right. And then they refer to Article 3, cases and controversies. Right. So far, this rule, this new Texas law, has not generated a single case that I've read about yet. Right. What right. do you think about my tactic of having a friend sue, me, sue my wife for abortion, have her pay the friend, friend pays her back, and then it's a defense against everybody else? Your wife? Your wife's going to... Uh, 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 my girlfriend. Oh, you know, so my girlfriend who... wants an abortion, so okay. I have my friend sue her. Yes. She pays him. He pays yeah. the money back. Yeah. And now she's got a defense under the law for everything. Ah, okay. That, I don't it, think they thought that through. No, there's a lot of variations that never really get thought through. And obviously, uh, you know, litigation lenders look at opportunities yeah, maybe there's not enough money and stuff like this. Obviously, litigation lenders like to invest money, patent cases, yes, uh, big business disputes. And they've actually gone and even created websites where they will accept money from really people that are like betting on horses almost. There's a, a site called Lex LexShare, I think it is. If you go to LexShare.com, literally, it's like selling... Uh -huh. uh, stakes in cases that you know they they vet. You know, think of it as they're vetting a case. So maybe it's Lex something else. I just went to Lex Share and it's 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 for sale. So there's there's some some of the <laughs> sites. It's for sale. That's in that's in keeping with the yeah, spirit of the yeah. There's some there's some there's a litigation funding site. Let me see if I could find the the actual name. Um, gosh. I thought it was called Lex Shares. Isn't that weird? That Lex Shares, plural. There you go. Commercial okay. litigation finance company. So why they're not buying Lex Shares is, is beyond me. But I'll put it on the screen. You may not have seen this, but I'm I'm looking at it now. Yeah, I mean, these guys literally have decided to crowdsource, crowdfund, yes, cases. So there's yes. you know literally they they have cases that. Uh, they're the bridge, so there's different case sizes, and they give you a little snub, like breach of fiduciary duty, you'll get a kick out of this. Professional athlete versus financial advisory firm, right? So they're uh -huh. selling, so if you press learn more, uh -huh. I don't know if there's a, a screen that stops you, but they literally will give you some data about this is a federal case where there's an investment of 750 going into a commercial litigation boutique firm for what they call a hybrid contingency. They have different classifications. The plaintiff, oh, I see it here. Yeah. Yeah. The plaintiff, a former professional athlete, 
agreed to become a client under false premises and transfer the management of his assets. And as a result of all these unauthorized securities transactions, blah, 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 a bunch of money was lost, right? So the yeah. 750 is looking for probably like a five to 10 X return right. on money. Right. And the trial date is set. So there's a lot of stuff that's going on here. A right. professional. So people, this will probably get funded pretty quickly. Like right. they literally start the clock running. And I have heard that they get funding within an hour, like within one hour of starting the clock saying this is becoming available. They will literally get this case funded. And they got, you know, all sorts of other things, business squeeze out, misappropriation of trade secrets, patent infringement. You could see the investments get bigger and bigger. Yeah. The case gets more and more complex. Yep. And, and so this is now a resource for litigants who don't have the, their own money and the law firms don't want to take it on a full contingency. Right. This money will actually pay not only the costs and the experts, it will actually also pay the lawyers. Correct. So it's a little bit like uh, turning lawsuits into uh, uh, investments. investments or gambling, depending on how you... Well want to look at what you're doing here, right? This is exactly what champerty means and what the British courts called a crime. Right. Exactly. But, but in the U.S., it seems to have been blessed. You know, it seems, it seems to, have, to have. I remember when I first heard about it 20 years ago mm -hmm. and talked to my friends and said, isn't this a crime? They just shrugged their shoulders and said, yes, but now it's become a movement. Well, in the U.K., it started and in Australia, it started a while ago. And there's actually public companies in both the UK and Australia, publicly traded companies that are like investment banks for lawyers right. and cases. And so I, I'm taking this concept and saying, are we going to see the same thing play out in, in this bounty area where maybe because of the legal fees that can be recovered, the numbers can get big? I don't know. Well, I mean, it seems like it's, it seems risky to imagine that a doctor is going to actually have enough money to pay what could be pretty big legal fees, right? Well, remember, the plaintiff doesn't have big fees at all because the, the nature of the tort, of, of, of the wrong, mm -hmm. is very clear. It's documented by the doctor's notes. And if there are no doctor's notes, then that's a win. So the, the plaintiff doesn't have to spend a lot of money. The defense may not have a defense. That's the, the fact unless he has facts that say, no, I didn't do it, or I didn't know. The fact that he didn't know about it might not be a defense under the statute. So I don't see a lot of legal fees being involved in these cases. Oh, so you, think, you think that fundamentally it's almost like a summary trial? Yeah, It's almost like a very, very fast one day, you know, what do the doctor's notes say, that sort Correct. of thing? Correct. Right? Seems to be. Interesting. Because I could see, I could see it becoming... Uh, something that generates a lot more potential depending on how the doctor chooses to defend uh, his or her actions, right? Depending on what approach is used. But well, maybe what you're is, right. What is the defense? If you read the statute, there is no defense. If he did it, there's no defense. Well, now, there's going to be a constitutional defense that's asserted, th right? That, that's different, but he's not going to have to do it. Somebody is going to do it, but he doesn't have to do it. Okay. But there also could be, uh, there could be factual disputes about did he encourage it? Right. Did he participate in it? Right. I don't know. I, I don't know how it would work in an abortion clinic if Dr. One did it. Is Dr. Two on the hook as well? Well, you'd have to also imagine that they're going to videotape the patient's Yes. And set up a really like she's in a lot of pain. Something's yes. going, to, it's going to be almost like a like a script. You have to do this. You have to do that. You have to do the other thing. Yes. Scream. We have to, you know, bloody up some some of your clothing. Like it's got to be there's going to be some uh, props, it seems to me, and a lot yeah. of videotape and a lot of like, OK, we're going to show the jury this or we're going to show the judge that. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, there's going to be enough witnesses and video and audio and everything else to make it, you know, sort of it's it's we know how to get around this stuff from a practical point of view. Maybe, maybe, maybe. we'll do that. 
So maybe you're right. Maybe litigation lenders have too many other fish that they can go after. And this is an area that they won't go in. But I have to tell you, I think that litigation has become almost sport to some degree in the way people look at, well, can I invest in this? Can I invest in that? It's almost like people want to root on certain causes too, right? Yes. So in environmental cases, there are uh, investments that are really more uh, about the politics of it than about the returns. Did really you about, see the, of supporting this because of its supports, yeah. you know, climate change or that? Sort yes. Of thing. Did you see the article I sent you earlier today? Yeah. The yeah. Mm -hmm. Isn't that something? Right. Right. Yeah. That, there are a lot of those kinds of cases. I don't know. It's hard to see where it'll go. But for me, thinking about what the function of a court should be. Standing some interest resolving disputes where both parties have some emotional investment in the dispute seems essential. And if we get to a place where that isn't happening, I think we ought to look carefully and do something about it. Well, that's the, ultimately the question of what do the federal courts end up doing? And I want to drop a footnote here. I'm going to send you a report that issued yesterday where there's been a lot of studies about how to modernize juries. Yes. And you know, that juries waste a lot of time, of courts waste a lot of time, lawyers waste a lot of time, wasting juries' time on so many trivial things. And so they did the study that suggested that maybe we really have to bring the jury process into the 21st century. So even in the voir dire part, Maybe you don't bring people to the courthouse. Maybe you do it over a Zoom channel from people's homes. Tell me about your experience and then make some judgment calls before you actually select the jury that's going to come in. Because there's a veneer of often 100, 120 jurors that are just sitting milling around waiting to get called into various courtrooms. It's a sure. logistical problem because you have the security, you now have the COVID risk. You have the fact that people need to be uh, fed and, and figuring out, you know, breaks and so many issues of moving these brains around that happen to be attached to bodies, as opposed to let's get them connected digitally and then streamline this process. Well, you know, if there's success at that level, you know where it goes next, which is do we really need to bring them to the courthouse Right. Or can we actually imagine that they're going to pay attention at home on a Zoom channel to the presentation of at least a summary of the case? Because it starts to become if you can't win based on a summary of the case, we can't give you two weeks of trial. And that might be the ultimate screening mechanism that we see, which is and this is to answer a question you raised a while ago. Part of what the foundation for creativity and dispute resolution is playing with and funding law schools and to some degree business schools to test is what if you change some of the ways in which you get the due process to, to translate? Like right now, we're stuck in what might be called 19th century approaches. We're really stuck. I mean, we really are. You got to have a person. They got to be in a jury box. They've got to be able to sit down. They've got to be able to follow instructions, blah, 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 blah. It's not the way business operates in the 21st century. Yeah. And it's not the way a lot of decisions are made at the yeah. highest level in government or business or anywhere else. Right. So part of what the foundation is trying to do is imagine what will it look like to give people information to make a judgment call about the value of a case or the value of a settlement range. And how do we, I don't want to say automate it, but how do we streamline it? Streamline it. Streamline it really in a very significant way. So we, we get the essential information that needs to be gotten, and then we get a reaction to it and some sort of insight from that reaction, right? Because we're playing with sort of a graph that's pretty well settled. I'm going to put it on the screen because I think it says so much, which is there's a lot of data 
you've seen this before. It's really what you, we started with. Lotus Notes is trying to turn all that data yeah. into more than just information, maybe more than knowledge, maybe some wisdom and yeah. some insight at the high level. That's what Lotus Notes was designed to do, as well as Slack and lots of other similar products that are yeah. on the market. And right now, in many ways, we're stuck not realizing that there must be a better way to get to wisdom than sort of the 19th century ways that we've been practicing it. That's the big mission of the foundation for All right. activity in dispute resolution. And well, it's, not like, it's not like there's an obvious roadmap either. It's I, not an obvious roadmap at all. I had two initiatives in this direction when I had an office with five or six lawyers in it. Right. First of all, I did mock trials on all my cases. Right. One, one day mock trials. Yes. And then I did that rent a judge ADR micro trials website where I offered one day micro trial. Right. With briefing in front and argument on the it could be Zoom in person. It could be in person or it could have been by phone, whatever. Right. And uh, give the parties the right to say, I don't like this result or I do like it. Right. And measure our success. This was the key. We measure our success by how often both parties like the result. Even the loser agreed right. with it. Right. And to me, that is advancing dispute resolution. But it's, it's very hard these days. I must say the courthouse has become a little irritating to me the more I go there these days. Well, I think the courthouse is like from the age of Dickens. I did a podcast with a guy who sat through, a good friend of mine, who sat through a three-week criminal trial. And he said it was amazing. I can't believe our tax dollars can't afford clean chairs for jurors to sit on. <laughs> rips rips in, the, in the upholstery, tape. Oh, and he said it, it felt... Like, is this Silicon Valley? Like these unbelievable mega billionaires that live there, live yeah. here, and that are running these mega trillion dollar companies, Apple, Google, Facebook, go down the list. And we have a courthouse that really is keeping the rule of law in place, but it's a shambles. And he said, we sat there for three weeks. We kind of observed everything that was wrong with the upholstery. Of course, you know, we have to pay attention to the criminal case, which we do. Yes. A, lot, yes. a lot of distractions, though, like can't believe there's still all that same dirt, the same cigarette butt, whatever is still there. Right. From whoever was improperly smoking, probably the night crew. And he said, you know, the case could have been decided in three hours. He said it lasted three weeks, but the basic story was like a th it was a rape case between uh, two 18 year olds. Uh -huh. like literally, an 18 year old kid got together with an 18 year old girl. She said no. He thought it was yes, I guess. And, it you know, th these are cases that, of course, years ago probably would never even have been prosecuted. But it was being prosecuted and they had 12 jurors and three weeks of trial with experts and DNA evidence. I mean, there was no question that they, they had sex, there was penetration, there was no question about any of that. The question was, was it consensual or not? Right. That was the question. He said, it's like all these witnesses hover around a million different things than the right. ultimate question, right? And right. of course, the ultimate question is unknowable. You unknowable. You're not there with those two people. And, they're and they may not know themselves. They, they may not even know themselves, right? Like, like Kavanaugh, right? Yeah, I Justice mean, it's Kavanaugh. like there's some line, and uh, usually the male gets it wrong, but I think equally these days with f aggressive females or, or females that are just normal females. Uh, but, but, you know, people are saying at some level that, you know, humans, when you get to that sort of reptilian brain, that operates the reproductive uh, incentives that we, we've had, particularly at 18. I mean, can you imagine? Probably the yeah. only time it's more racy is 17, right? right. And that would right. be statutory rape, right? right? That would have been statutory rape. But they're Until both they adults. change the statute. Yeah, they're both adults. And this guy, kid is convicted, the 18 year old kid was convicted. He said that there were two of the, you know, he was, he was in the majority with 10 of the 12. There were two that were like questioning, well, he's only 18 and maybe it was confusing. 
And ultimately, they had to persuade these two to come over, and they convicted this this eighteen year old of both counts. I think the uh, I think the sentencing is going to be about ten years. You know, for ten minutes, he's going to be incarcerated for ten years. Now, uh, probably a, a mistake of a lifetime there by him. But he said Ugh. the evidence was pretty clear and pretty damning, even beyond a reasonable doubt. But he was amazed that it took three weeks of his time. And this is a busy executive. And he said, you know, I was surprised they called me. I told them I have two daughters. They're both, you know, in their teens. Do you really like, like, am I the right juror for this case? And they were like, yeah, we want you. Both sides wanted him as a juror. So he told the story. But the interesting part of it was when you think about it, that case probably could have and should have been streamlined in a way that probably would have ended up in some plea bargain, mm -hmm. which probably would have been far better for that particular uh, defendant. Right. Because usually there's a lot more leniency. Once a case goes to trial, they usually just throw the book at you because they're like, the system will break down if every defendant really wanted a trial. Right. The plea, the plea uh, bargaining system is a key part of keeping the system operating. Right. But, you know, he was amazed. He said... Had there been no innovations at all? Like, he was like, this whole thing should have been, like, the facts are, all the background facts are stipulated to. Now we get to the juicy part. You know, let's hear what the, what the victim has to say. Let's hear the defendant actually testified and apparently was not that credible. And the cross-examination of that defendant was pretty, pretty well done, apparently. So. Still, as you say, it's unknowable. And uh, I think, you know, there are a lot of things that are prosecuted to which there are no witnesses possible, and they shouldn't be prosecuted, in my opinion. But we ha we're not there yet. No, I, I think, if anything, the goalposts have completely changed. If, yes. if, you, are, if you are in a relationship, boyfriend, girlfriend, whatever it is, and there is not an enthusiastic yes, <laughs> You have to treat it as a no. I mean, yes. literally, it, it, it really, the goalposts have really moved yes. in a direction mm -hmm. that probably have pretty much surprised both that defendant and, of course, his parents were there and they were crying. And, you know, of course, they, they spent a bunch of money on a private attorney to defend them sure. and uh, you know, changed that entire, shattered that entire family. Of he course, should have recorded it, whatever it was. Yeah, I mean, these days I, that's easier. I mean, I don't know. You know, people used to laugh about some of the Silicon Valley single billionaire guys that would have what are called a date agreement with whoever they were <laughs> dating. That yes. you have to sign off on this, that, you know, you're never going to sue me and we have, have a consensual relationship. They, they're worried about being set up. Right. They're worried about being set up. And you could say in a litigious society, that's cer certainly something you have to worry about. You know that Trump had some, several such agreements and they haven't been upheld. Right. I mean, to some degree, you'd say, can you contract your way out of something okay. that is, is, is sort of a right to bodily integrity, right? Correct. I mean, in, in a way, maybe this is the final sort of question or final remark, is the fact that we're moving so much of what typically has been privately handled into the public courts itself a statement that we're not evolving in the right direction. The fact that we can't get to some closure maybe that could have happened between that particular victim and that particular defendant. I don't know what would have done it, what would have resolved it, but she obviously decided to charge uh, that was her choice to make. I'm sure there are a lot of women that often decide against charging, even though they have grounds Correct. to do it. Probably 80, 90 percent of the time, they just say it's too embarrassing, Correct. Too, 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 too intense, too, too public. Right. But conceptually, when you look at the big picture, is it like what you were saying, which is we've had this problem since 6th century B.C. and we're going to have it? to the 26th century AD, it's gonna continue. It's just okay. the way human evolution has not progressed. And, you know, that's an interesting way of looking at human evolution and the role of the court in our society. 
Right. So that's that's what we need to think through carefully. Well, you and I, particularly since we're lawyers. I mean, clearly, I think the Greeks of the sixth century BC would be shocked at how many judges, how many courthouses, how many different oh, yeah. levels. Like they'd be like, "What?" Well, how you know, they didn't have they didn't have that. And of, the, yeah, how much of your GDP are you spending on the justice system? Right. What do does know? that look like? Do we know? It's a big number because you hear law firms that are now getting, I mean, it's unheard of. Law firms are getting, the big law firms are getting to over a billion dollars of revenue. I mean, that number, no one could fathom. No one could imagine that a collection of lawyers billing whatever the amount of time is that they have to bill on an hourly basis at whatever rate they're billing it could collectively get to a billion dollars of revenue. But I think the top 10 San Francisco firms have all got over a billion dollars of revenue. I mean, that's just an amazing statement when you think about it. Yes, it is. These are private. These are private organizations, typically with maybe 50 to 100 partners sharing most of the equity. At that level, it's a pretty big number to share yes. if you're thinking yes. about those numbers. And I never thought that we would see law become the degree of business that we've seen law become. Like literally, it's at a level where it really is at the, at the highest level of big law. You know, big law firms typically now over a thousand lawyers per firm, um, headed to maybe 10,000 lawyers per firm is where people are saying. I mean, look at higher from firms where, you know, five to 10 lawyers was almost viewed as getting too big, right? Correct. Like a big firm used to be 50 lawyers. Correct. Wow, now lawyers? That's small now, right? And and the medical profession is following a similar track uh, with insurance companies and, you know, medical profession, business development in the medical profession setting. It's getting the professions... When did the profession start? I think it was in the Renaissance. Yeah, even earlier. You should look at it. Yeah, even earlier. I think it's earlier even- than the Renaissance, but it was vocation, the concept of vocation. I think it was maybe earlier than the Renaissance, but not much earlier. But the concept of vocation has turned into opportunity seeking, you know, business development. And, and, and now we're seeing law firms, particularly big law firms, marry really by acquisition high-tech AI software firms and create, hey, we're domain experts, but you're software experts, and we will gel this together to create the next level of, and then fill in the blank, the automated IPO, the automated patent application, the automated uh, uh, litigation strategy. Like the theory is that well, we don't want to have lots of associates anymore. We want to have a lot of robots. Right. And we want those robots to be like little oil pumps that are spewing out information. And I think that's the big business model that's about to explode with these big firms being so profitable. They're pumping those dollars into automation tools. They're not pumping the dollars into a training program at all for young associates. I mean, they're not doing that. It's not the guild system. It's not the uh, system that Lincoln grew up on, where he learned from other lawyers. That's not what we're seeing. No. So I think we're we're seeing a a transition, and I don't know if it's gonna be good. I don't think it's gonna be great for, for, for most lawyers. I mean, maybe it's gonna be great for lawyers that make their way into big firms and get up, get up the progress at some level. I mean, it'd be interesting to see where that lands. Thank you for your time. It's been a wonderful chat. It's I'm, been I'm a pleasure. A number of good topics. And uh, we should keep the discussion going because I do think there's another angle to look at this doctor-patient fiduciary relationship itself being challenged in a way that you could say, maybe there's there's something there in fiduciary duty law that needs to be protected. There's almost an entity of doctor and patient that itself is being shattered 
by uh, civil litigation risk, right? Well, civil, yes, and insurance. The insurance industry is a big problem. I've been reading more about how doctors are forced to spend a lot of time filling out forms for insurance payments. Right. And they don't have time to see the patients anymore. Yeah, it changes everything, right? In many ways, if you have to be accountable, it keeps changing things over yeah. and over again. So, I mean, let's, do, me, this. let's yeah. do this again. It's a real pleasure. Thank you for coming. It was really fun and we'll do it again. And I'll suggest some additional specific topics. All right. Okay. Thanks. I'll look forward to it. Good. Thanks very much. Have a good well, time. See you later. Bye. 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 Tune in next time on The Valley Current.